those literary licensed podcast episodes. Ben Stokes here, exploring all things Collinsport, Maine, and following the likes of the Collins family, and the friends and foes, with your co-hosts, Tom Diamond, Jesse Fultz, Mickey Ray, and Keith Chalgo, Collins family, story about blood relations, literally. Welcome to Literary License Podcast, and today we have Laura Parker with us. Um, she's an actress, writer, and she's best known for her role as Angelique, but she has a lot more to share with us. Hello, Laura. Welcome to the Literary License Podcast. Hello. How are you, Keith? Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you. And of course, we have us, Tom Diamond with us, and we also have Vicki Ray. Hi, Hello. everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hi, Vicki. <laughs> Hi, Miss Hi, Tom. Laura. Hi, Laura. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Laura. It's very nice to meet you all. So I thought how we would start our podcast is just um, talk a little bit about what your life was before and how you got into acting. And it looks like you grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee. What was it like growing up in Mem- around Memphis area? I guess I was born in Knoxville. Oh, Knoxville. I grew up in Memphis, and uh, it was it was what was it like? Well, you know in some ways provincial compared to Los Angeles or New York, but um, I had a lovely childhood and, and I, be- I started acting when I was about eight or nine uh, in the little theater and in, um, on radio, they had radio Saturday afternoon radio shows and I, I auditioned for anything that I could from, I also started working in the little theater and I also started doing plays when I was in college. I went to Vassar two years and then I came back and graduated from the university from the from Southwestern College which I think it's I think there's another name now but anyhow uh, I majored in uh, philosophy so um, Vassar but I was in a lot of plays sorry Vassar's impressive (laughs) Vassar's impressive and so is philosophy I'm impressed myself yeah Uh, yeah (laughs) <laughs> but, would, you like to, would you like to share with our listeners who your um, who your dorm mate was in Vassar? <laughs> yes. Oh God! Yes, I, I my second year in Vassar, I was uh, well. There were actually six of us, six or eight of us, who shared three rooms, and and one of the, my roommates was Jane Fonda. Awesome! So. Wow. Yeah. So, we got a yeah, we, so for a while there, we were we were very close friends, and that was that was interesting. <laughs> so, from what actually um, drew you to? Um, um, and, yeah. What um, was that, Laura? What did you say? You were talking about uh, about Jane Fonda. Well, yeah, her her they had both been to Emma Willard. They'd both been to private schools, and they were you know these were extremely sophisticated wealthy girls and I was kind of a little hick from Tennessee so it was it was a culture shock to say the least plus I was quite young I was only 16 oh my goodness when I went away to college Mm -hmm. because when I was little I skipped a grade and and did the first of I guess four years and three years and I was always younger than anyone else in my class so that, were, that was, I always felt a little different, a little separated. Uh huh. Overachiever at an early age. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might say that. Yeah. Not a bad. Quality. And then I, um, <laughs> then I started working in the in the local theater in Memphis, and even if I had to work backstage or do props or take notes for the director, I just wanted to be in the theater. It, I just it just felt like the place I belonged. And after a while, I got a few interesting roles, but you know, it's mostly the chorus of guys and dolls, and and you know, small parts. And then um, when I when I went away to Vassar, I actually did some roles in the University Theater, and then um, I did some parts when I was I joined the Little Theater when I was in uh, at Southwestern in Memphis. This is sounding very confused, isn't it? <laughs> oh. You graduated from Iowa, correct? Um, I got married, and I had, I guess, 
Oh, let's see. God, it's so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, uh, yeah. I, I went to the I went to the University of Iowa. I went to the University of Iowa, and did um, a year there in graduate school in drama. Mm-hmm. I guess I thought I might become some sort of drama teacher, but I ended up getting married, and I ended up having a baby, and so becoming a professional actress was sort of out of the question at that point. Wow. Yeah. And I moved with my husband first to Missouri, where I went to the University of Missouri and took um, acting classes, and then he and I and another couple founded a theater in Arrow Rock, Missouri, and put on classic plays, Sheridan, Shaw, Shakespeare, plays with costumes in a tiny little church that had been abandoned um, down next to the river bottom. Actually, the river had changed course, but it was um, the pews with the seats, and behind the altar, we built a little stage and put on these plays. Oh, and it cool. was it was a it was a time out of time. Wow. And I had a new baby. <laughs> mm-hmm. I had a new baby, so um, I didn't get to play any roles the first year because of the fact that I, I, when they started rehearsal, I still hadn't given birth. So I ended up making all the costumes, oh, wow. and I made the costumes for the importance of being earnest, which were bustle dresses. Wow! And I can remember crawling across the floor, cutting them out, trying not to bleed on the fabric because you know oh. you're still bleeding after you give birth. Oh, tiny yeah. little baby, I feel tiny like little baby. baby that <laughs> I didn't have. We didn't have anywhere really to sleep. We slept on the floor. But we put the baby in a hammock, which we hung from the walls of the of the barn where we were sleeping. And when he cried, we'd uh, we'd kick this hammock. We had it over our bed <laughs> bed rolls, and we'd kick oh, it, and oh, it would wow. swing in this giant arc. And he'd sleep for a while. And I <laughs> oh, remember taking the <laughs> I remember taking the uh, the diapers down to the stream. Now this will horrify it. Environment. Oh, this is when there was cloth diapers, yeah. <laughs> yep, and washing the diapers in the stream and putting his little bottom in the stream in the cold stream. Oh, wow! He would scream, and I remember, you know, nursing him between and ex- exits and entrances when I was doing rehearsals. And you know, sometimes if I did the performance, he'd be. Well, actually, I didn't do any. I, I, I got to be the understudy, which meant that I, I was able to do the Admiral Crichton and importance of being earnest when uh, something happened to the actress. But it was a wonderful story. The, um, the church had a steeple with a bell in it, and, and uh, a vine, vines had grown up into the bell, and I thought, God, it would be so great if we could ring the bell to call the acts. So, because the people were wandering around and outside, but you know, after Act One and Act Two, mm-hmm. so one of our actresses actually she became quite well known, Susan Flannery. I think she was on oh, yeah. a the doctors soap opera for a long time. Do- yeah, doctors. and she also yep. became a a producer, right? Yep. She um, she was playing Gwendolyn in The Importance of Being Earnest, and she uh, she said, "I'll pull that wine out of there and that vine out of there." So up she went. She ripped all the vine out, never realizing that it was poison oak. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my the God. Opening night. Oh, my God. Opening night, her hands and her arms were swollen <laughs> to the oh. point where she couldn't get them in the sleeves of her dress. Wow. So before she went on stage, I took a razor blade, slit the seam, put her in the dress, sewed it back on her, put gloves on her hands, and she went on and she did she show did the must show. go on. <laughs> yeah, the uh, Arrow Rock used to be on the river, and they used to have um, pad- paddle boats that would come down the river with, you know, um, shows, girly shows and burlesque and gambling. And we were told that the, the, the preacher would ring the bell, and all of his congregation would gather in the church, 
and he'd lock the door to keep them from going down and gambling and seeing oh, the naked girlies. <laughs> so, so, so we opening night of our theater, there was a giant thunderstorm, and we had a lot of people from St. Louis who were thinking of investing in the theater, and it was a very hot night. And there was a thunderstorm and a lightning storm and all of the electricity went out and the air conditioner went out and we parked cars on the hill and shone the, the headlights into the windows and did the play. No <laughs> Yeah, so that's there's. I have many, many stories of Arrow Rock. That's a great putting the baby. Yeah, in. I mean it was. Because it's you know when you're young you just and you want you want to be in a play. You, I guess you just do just about anything, you know. Well, the hammock is really a great idea because that just yeah. keeps babies quiet. They just love motion. So I feel your pain on that yeah. one. I had, I had three children. Yeah. So I feel yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just tie the ends to the ceiling and. Swing away. <laughs> and it's really bohemian. I mean, it's amazing. Yes. To hear. Yeah, that's such a, a such an atmosphere existed in the deep south. You know, you would usually think of Greenwich Village when you think of things like that. That's yeah. I remember making the act curtain, which was, of course, yards and yards and yards and yards. And I had my sewing machine on the floor, and I just had people pushing the fabric through the sewing machine so that we could sew it up so that we could hang it on the the hooks to draw to pull the curtain open and closed and we used to we had little we built little um platforms outside for our you know for off stage and we'd sit on these little platforms with our hair done up in these bouffant hair this is the second year and, and these beautiful silk dresses and little boys Little African American boys would pass by with their fishing rods, going down to the river to to uh, to go fishing, and we call out, "Don't you want to come see the play?" And they'd say, "I can't understand that English," <laughs> <laughs> because we all talked, we all spoke in English accents. I mean, it's an amazing to, when you think of the contrast between what we decided to do in the area and where we chose to do it. Well, you, well, you um, know, going back to your background, Lara, you apparently had some famous ancestry. Uh, I see that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that. very famous. Well, my, my friends all call me Lamar. Lamar is my given name, and I was named after my great-great-grandfather, whose name was Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus Lamar. He's uh, he's what featured in. <laughs> My God. He, yeah, LQC. It they called like him LQC. Roman. He sounds like a. Yeah, C yeah I know. Exactly. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah. Lots of names. He's featured in Kennedy's Profiles of Courage. He was a. Um, so he was a he was ambassador to uh, France for the Confederacy. He was a senator and he was a Supreme Court justice. Okay. And. The reason he really became famous is because after the Civil War, when uh, there was so much division in the country, he gave a speech in which he said it's time to, to bury the hatchet uh -huh. and come together as one nation. And he knew he was losing his constituency when he did that because and all the people who had originally supported him and voted for him against him because the South right. was so... Mm you know, filled with um, uh, just anger over what had happened. So right, he, right. He, he was not reelected, but he was, it, it was very brave for him to do that. And, you know, not very many politicians get up and say what they truly think, knowing they won't get elected again. True. I mean, if you think about it. <laughs> so. <laughs> mm -hmm. so what actually brought you to, um, so from Missouri, did you move to New York after that for, to, um, look at your acting. Uh, yeah, I um, I went back to Iowa to try to finish my to my get my masters. I mm -hmm. you know I'd started it years before, and my husband was willing to take care of the kids. I had two boys, and uh, they were about seven, eight, nine. I met some people there, and they were going to a play in New York. So uh, this is I was I was at the University of Iowa in graduate school and we all got in the car and drove all night to see this Broadway play 
and I sat next to an agent who represented one of the actors in the play. And he became quite friendly with me. And I said, you know, that I wanted to be an actor. He's ICM. He had just started there, and he was quite young. He was looking for clients. He said, well, I like you a lot. You know, get in touch with me if you ever come back to New York. So, I mean, it's so it's so strange the way life has a way of just, you know, you, you make this choice, and then you make another. And what happens is so unexpected and so, so unpredicted unpredictable and so he um he got back in touch with me he wrote me a couple of times and um i decided um at one point to um go to i was i was hired by a director who'd come all the way i was living then in um whitewater wisconsin and um he had come to direct a play in whitewater at the theater there every time everywhere i went I auditioned for a play at the theater, whatever the theater was, buried away in the boondocks. <laughs> he came and he said that he was going to do us, um, that he was going to, in um, Connecticut, he was going to do a full season. He was going to direct a full summer season, summer stock. And he wanted me to come and be the leading lady. My husband planned to go to Paris. <laughs> So I turned down the summer in Paris. Oh no! To go to I know to go to Lock Haven, Connecticut, and be the leading lady. In I did five, six plays in five weeks. Mm. Well, that's what summer stock is like. You rehearse one play in the day, and you do another play at night. And this, um, I I called this agent. I said, Hey, I'm you know, I'm going to be in these plays. You should come and see me. He said, Well, I can't come and see you, but come to New York. When you're finished. So I went to New York and I sat in his office and he said, I really like you. I want to sign you. Um, you know, when can you come back? Well, at this point, my husband and my two children, we'd all moved to Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. We had to go there. So he said, why don't you just three weeks? And... Uh, We'll see what, you know, we'll see if we can get anything going. Well, the first week I got a play. Interesting enough, I got a, a play with Joan Bennett. Oh, no it was wow. actually, it, it was actually um, some Barefoot in the Park. She was doing Barefoot in the Park with some, or, there's not a part for her in that. Well, yeah, she was doing some wonderful play in, in summer stock and, or summer theater or something. And then the next day, I auditioned for Dark Shadows. So I got that, and I'd been in New York three weeks, and I auditioned for Dark Shadows. They were looking for someone that, they, they, their plan was to go back in time and tell the story of how Barnabas became a vampire, and they had decided to go back to the 1890s, 1895. So they were looking for actors who had done period drama, and since I had done so much, they I got I got to audition and I got the part. I auditioned for Dan Curtis. And, it wouldn't have been the same without you. I'm just saying. Maybe I'm just partial. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes they say that a part will come along that is so perfect for your personality that you know the the match works, and I think. I think that's really, uh, it was a stretch, really a stretch. Well, when I first started on the show, um, I'd always played leading ladies. I wasn't a character actress. I was, basically, I wanted to be the princess, whatever the show was. I, that was my goal, to be the princess. So I, you know, I, I played Angelique like the heroine the wrong heroine and I cried and I, you know, you were I felt wrong. very sorry for Terrible. myself. You were totally dissed by Barnabas. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, so Jonathan Fred, this was about three weeks into the show and he took me aside and he said, you know, you're really missing a bit. And I said, what? He said, you're not the heroine. You're the heavy, you're the villain. And I said, really? And he said, yes, you're, you're horribly, horribly jealous. You want to kill all these people. <laughs> I said, oh, dear. I, I, I said, well, I've never really been jealous in my life. 
He said, just dig deep. You'll find it. He uh-huh. said, this is a great role. He said, you should really sink your teeth into it. Literally. And so then I started I thinking. Did. You know, I, you did I started, I know, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> well, you know, he, he had actually encouraged me in the audition uh, when they gave me the scene, which, you know, was was simply the scene in which Barnabas made it clear that he was not in love with Angelique, that he intended, that he was in love with her mistress and he was going to marry Josette. And she, she wept and she, you know, she clung to him and she said, don't you remember those nights in Martinique, how much we loved one another? Well, he whispered to me during the audition. He said, she's a witch. You know, she's a witch. Well, there's nothing about a witch in the audition. It was just this scene where, you know, he rejected her and she she wept. And I went, a witch? And I just turned and looked at the camera. And I did this hell hath no fury like a woman scorned it kind is. of look. And uh, the cameraman moved into my eyes. And I got the part. I mean, that's what, that's how fluky it all is, you know. <laughs> you just never know dolls. what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> what? <after> voodoo dolls. <laughs> yeah, after that, voodoo dolls. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> after that, spells and, and, and incantations and then all the great things we got to do, you know, appear and disappear and set, set things on fire and hit people over the head and, and, you know, wonderful. I mean, five years of playing this witch who basically made everybody miserable. Yeah. You wreaked uh, that. But I, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> what I was going to ask is, um, so you go into dark shadows after a year it's been running and it's quite a close knit, um, cast of actors at this point. What was it like to come in, um, on your first day with this, you know, all these characters that have been working together for a full year? Well, um, it was for the first day that we were going back in time. So Catherine Lee Scott, who was playing Josette, it was the first time we had gone back to 1895, and and she was, you know, just as nervous as I was. And the first moment we came on the set, we had to speak French, which was really ridiculous because neither <laughs> of us spoke French. And we had to do five or six lines in French, which the fans have been trying to, to un unraveled now for weeks they've been trying to figure out just exactly what it was we said (laughs) because our French pronunciation was awful what was it like you know it was you're frozen with fear exactly I mean you 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 just just get through it it's a it's 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 many 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 months before you can do what actors call work on Mm. camera which is actually you know become one with the lines and really personalize it and really listen and really, you know, don't have any expectations of your reactions, but just play the scene for real. Because in the beginning, um, you have to hit your mark. You won't be in the light. You have to remember all these lines. You have to remember when the camera's coming to you, when the camera's not on you and you can move. Um, you have to remember so many things more than just being in a play where, where you know, you've had a lot of rehearsal. We had no rehearsal. Three rehearsals in the morning, we'd go down on the stage, block it in front of cameras, and if we were lucky, we would have a dress rehearsal. wouldn't. And it was live, right? And often we would have... It was it was right. essentially live because right. we didn't edit. Oh, we yeah. have blooper tape. Or, stereo went wrong. or you tripped over a tombstone because the tombstones were made out of styrofoam. Yeah. Or you slam the door and the picture fell off the wall. I mean, classic. Well, the, we're had, the, we have, fan, the fans, the fans, in fact, I love the bloopers. Just kill. Oh, they love it. I mean, they love it. You know, the prop man, you know, sneaking through the back of the set, and <laughs> many, many, many times when people forgot lines or they called someone by the wrong name, we had well, a teleprompter, you know, which was a a, a big thing with paper that rolled and it was hooked onto oh, the camera. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and your words were written out in very large letters. But the person running the teleprompter would, you know, he'd go to sleep or something. 
something and you'd look up and <laughs> oh, no. it wouldn't be anywhere near your lines. Or oh, no. if you did look up, it was it was very, very obvious because you'd see the actor's eyes kind of shift over to the side looking at the teleprompter. So um You were talking about the fly actually, uh and that and the fans yeah. the fans have dubbed that the Collinsport fly. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he was one of our actors. <laughs> he had a part. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Not credited. <laughs> but it was but it was good. Um I I under uh, Jonathan gave you a, a lot of encouragement during those years. I, he uh, did, yes. He mm -hmm. did. And I played many, many, many scenes with him. And I had no problem with lines remembering lines, but he had a terrible problem. Oh, and I can thought. remember so I can remember many times when I'd <laughs> see this stricken look at, yeah, he's his eyes would just I mean he he would be terrified because he was in the middle of the scene and he couldn't remember his line. He used to say that when he was an actor when when he was an actor, he was still an actor. But when he used to do Shakespeare in Canada that he Sometimes he'd just be in the middle of Richard the Third, and he'd start saying lines from Henry V because <laughs> he'd just get lost, you know. <laughs> and um, he learned lines in the old-fashioned way. He learned them word by word. And, you know, it's very easy to go up mm. if you don't connect your lines to the action and to the interior thoughts that you're having. So he he would go up a lot. And But the interesting thing was I would – and this is a real lesson in acting – he would become uh, terrified and humiliated and truly frustrated and really desperate when he couldn't remember his lines. And sometimes I would look at him and I'd think, oh, he's just blowing this off. Oh, this is awful. And then the week later, we'd all sit in the green room. Sometimes we'd go down and we'd watch the show that we had rehearsed um, the week before, or that we had taped the week before and he'd be wonderful why because he was the tortured vampire yeah so all this yep. agony he was yep. experiencing yep. played into the scene perfectly awesome and yep. it was so believable yep. it was so touching your heart went out to him you went oh the man is suffering he is suffering and he yeah, was well. suffering you know <laughs> I mean, yeah, he was probably the first vampire with reluctance and regret, you know? He didn't Hated want to do it, you know, his character. So. Well, I yes, have to he be was morose. I have to, I have to was... tell for Angelique, I thought to myself, oh, you can always do better. You can always do better. <laughs> she was like, fine. I was like, <laughs> oh, did you? Better than Barnabas? Oh, yeah. I thought, I thought, oh, firstly, it's like, you know, I thought, oh, you can just do so much better. It's like, God, it's like, you know, I always thought that, I always thought that Barnabas <laughs> is a bit horrible to, to Angelique for some reason. I understand that oh, he was. He had his love for Josette, but I thought to myself, like, he wasn't very nice to Josette, really. And, and I, I know, was, he tried to kill and Josette. And Angelique's like totally in love with him. And it's like, uh, and then. You know, he forces then, Josette out of her grave, but her face is all smashed <laughs> up. I mean, how inopportune. <laughs> I know, and he had other girlfriends. I mean, he had several oh, other girlfriends. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. And, I always, and I always thought, <laughs> even as Angelique's character, like, went on through time and stuff like this, and then it'd be like, she'd have this, like, chance of happiness, and he'd just come through and try to ruin it for her. It's like, why don't you just let her live her life? Go on, leave her. Like, <laughs> but no one else could have it. Like, oh. That's what Well, I mean, that... Do, <laughs> I think that triangle of Josette and Angelique and Barnabas was the was kind of the the it's base. Good. It was kind of the foundation of Dark Shadows. It was. So it was they couldn't resolve it, mm -hmm. and you know, to resolve it would have been the end of the show. So right. Right. Oh, when right. they so finally went off the air, they too. resolved it. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, so I always wanted Angelique to win. This is like I just wanted to. You know, every, every time I like, did too. We were rooting for you. Go on, go on. It's like oh. Well, that actually well, happened. Actually, well, you know, that actually happened when Angelique became the vampire, and that always fascinated me. That here, you know, she's she's being punished for uh, being, uh, you know, for being nasty with, you know, uh, and of course against Nicholas Blair's wishes, played by Humperdinck and Estrado. And how did that 
come about, uh, Lara, that, you know, where they decided to make you the vampire? And uh, you played that with much gusto, as I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Um, she was made... Hum- uh, Nicholas made Angelique a vampire because right. it's a punishment right. for having fallen in love. Um, someone who serves the devil is not supposed to fall in love with another human. That's one of the rules of witchdom. Right. And Humbert and I had a, you know, we, we worked together very well. We, he gave me a lot. Of, he, he was a real acting teacher, gave me a lot of really good pointers. And so we had a kind of amusing relationship where we're always ca- taunting each other. You know, he was very condescending with me and, <laughs> Uh, and you know, and as as Angelique and I, you know, rejected him and resented him. So we had some good spats, and, and we we were a good team, the two of us. Um, but that's why he he turned her into a vampire to punish her, to make her realize what it was like to be a vampire. And you know, this interesting thing is that she then knew what she had done. All of the characters had you know another side to them. And Angelique was no exception. You know, she had a very vulnerable side and she had a broken heart Mm. and she never, ever gave up. Yeah. And that was what was, that was what made it so interesting to be able to write that first book, Angelique's Descent, because I was able to tell what had been in my imagination, the story of her romance with Barnabas when she was quite young. And he had seduced her and told her that he would take her to New England. The Americas. And that he would, and, and, yeah, and that she would be his wife. And He had it coming. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in the book, I was able to write that whole story, the romance and, you know, all the sexual encounters. And, right. And so I was able to fill it all in so that you knew why she was so desperate to get him back. And that's a good thing and because why she there, bl- really, there really was no uh, prequel to what happened in Martinique. It just, no. All you knew no. in the story was that, you know, you were in love with him and really there was no closure to the beginning of your story with him. No, you know, I had to kind of make it up in my mind and remember it as something that I imagined, you yeah. know. Um, I mean, so I mean, that was... That, the, the truth of the story is that basically... Um, Barnabas is with Gisette, but he was stepping out with Angelique. And it's, I mean, it was kind of like a Jerry Springer um, moment, really. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe's never upset about it. Her character is never upset about it. She was la, la, la. <laughs> but I, I have to add that um, your portrayal of Angelique through the whole series of Dark Shadows, you, I think what makes Angelique alive for me, and the reason why I always look forward to whenever she does appear and, no, and then when she disappears, I do miss her. I think it's because right. you have that vengeful side, but there is that sympathetic, your heart breaks for her at the same time, and you can understand where it all coming from. And that basically all come. there's not so much in the lines that are portrayed that, that you're speaking. It's a lot the way that you acted it. And, and there's a vul- and that vulnerability that you portrayed on screen is second to none. I mean, it really, I think that's why Angelique is such a, it's the character that's, you know, that's so much alive today as it was back then. And I think it's because of your portrayal of her. This was his hubris. This was his fate, that he had brought this on himself. You know, there was always this artistic tension. And he loved any great story. Gone with the wind. You know, you just want to tell Scarlett, <laughs> shut up. Go with Brett and be happy you for God's sake. halfway you know? through the movie, just and like, she, oh, my God. You just want to strangle her, yeah. Well, I mean, and, when and, you know, with Ashley, you're like, how wet can uh, anyone be? <laughs> really, Ashley? <laughs> really? There you are. <laughs> there you are. But it's yeah. true, though. Jonathan Fritz's character as Barnabas, he really, he just doesn't get it, does he? I mean, I mean, leading a young girl by the nose, you know, and even into America and then being in love with her mistress and everything, he kind of just casts this character aside. And there's just no report. That's why it was so much fun to write about it in this book, because I was able to say those things to him. And he was, he, he made, you know, every attempt 
to defend himself. <laughs> and he was still drawn right. to her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was a gentleman and she was a yeah, servant. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, from the very beginning, you know, he was, he, she was a dalliance yeah. to him. Exactly. But she could still walk into his bedroom, close the right. door and seduce him. Something that, because he was still drawn that to Josette her. that could yeah. never do, I think. And, uh, the, and I was not knowing that he was, not knowing that Angelique was a witch, he figured, okay, she's a servant girl. You know, uh, after after he decided, well, I want to marry Josette, he figured, you know, he'd apologize to the, Angelique, and that would be the end of it. And little did he know what he was getting in for. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but but I but I always <laughs> thought it was very interesting, uh, Laura. If you may remember, during the 1897 period, there was actually a point at which Angelique became friends with Julia. When a play uh, by a play by Grayson Hall, when right. uh, Julia went back yes. into time, and 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 you would think, uh, you know, and of course the Julia character who had the unrequited love affair with Barnabas, and uh, right. you know, yes. always buried, buried the biz, uh, you know that kind of thing, and she emoted so well, and now the two enemies that you would think, I mean, you know, she hated Angelique for what she he, she, she had done to him, and there was how did that evolve? How did it evolve? Well, you know, we had four writers, and they came up with it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we played it. There's your answer. There's your answer. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, it. It's it, this. The show went on a long time, and they, you know, mm -hmm. there's so many things that made our show unique, and one one of them was uh, the depth of character that was spread over time. Characters change. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, turning turn of the screw and the picture of Dorian Gray and right. Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, and and I mean even even the some of the greatest writers that ever wrote anything. Oh, we, we used their stories. Plus, you know, it, there was it was like mythology. I mean, it there was there was magical realism. All of the things that happened that were magical were assumed to be true, which was the difference between our portrayal and ours when Johnny Depp decided to do right. it when they did the film. Yep. Yep. Um, they, you know, for, for them it was a joke. Yeah. And you, you were in it with them. You know, it was a wink to the audience. Right. Now, this is a delicious thing to be in on the story with the actors and the actors or to be in on the story with the writers. It's, 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 it's very amusing, but it's not what, what Dark Shadows was. Right. Dark Shadows was, a, was another world, and it had a dark sophistication and, and a seriousness, and it wasn't cute. No. It was sometimes, it was sometimes campy, but not intentionally. Right. You know, our Barnabas would never have hung from the chandelier no. to tell no, the world no. that he was a bat. No. No. That's an intriguing, delicious idea, but it's a completely different tone from the show that we, that our fans had fallen in love with, which was, was far more serious. And we never played scenes as though the audience should be getting this with us, mm. as you would comedy. We played, I mean, we were encouraged to play every single scene with total conviction. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I hope you understand that. The integrity of the show it was, was overwhelming. Real. I mean, it was so Shakespearean. It was real. Exactly. It was real. When you Played told that, that ghost, when you told that ghost to get back in his grave, you weren't going, I'm talking to a ghost yeah. now, you know. You went. You, it was like life and death, and so much conflict, and so much depended on it. And the writers knew that, and they what they were writing was something that, and you know, it's it's actually never been done again, because people oh, yeah. think when they write horror that they have to write blood and guts and eyeballs falling right. out and and screams and teeth and yeah. You know, mechanical teeth that flash into yeah, the sparkly vampires. It's like a mirror ball. You don't need a mirror ball. Visceral, you know? Sparkly yeah. vampires. They weren't sparkly in Dark Shadows. I mean, what always drew me to Dark Shadows well, 
when I was a kid, it's like, you know, I quite like, you know, the vampires and the werewolves and stuff like this. But as an adult, it's the intriguing storylines. And I think that right. the storylines is really what sells it because they're so intriguing and they're complicated and they're very complex. Every right. yeah. relationships are very complex. And they're well, very well, yeah, and, and I think that's probably what sets Dark Shadows aside from a lot of the daytime, well, soap operas or daytime dramas, depending on who, who you're talking to. Some people find soap opera a bit. I hope I'd call it a soap good. opera, actually. Well, yeah, but it, in, in the industry, it's considered, you know, you're downplaying it. But if, I think it's one of the most intricate storylines, Dark Shadows as a whole, compared to any other daytime drama at that moment in time or ever since. Well, Jonathan came up with a and the love the love lasts through the ages. Yes. But Brigadier yeah. has a happy ending. Yeah. I mean, he goes back and that, stays. That's why right, he said yeah. it was a dark dune. It was a dark shadow. Yeah. Dark Brigadier. There you go. Have the yeah. happy ending. Yeah. Uh, so that, well, you know, it's Dark Shadows is on the air at midnight every night on a station called Decades. Yeah. Yep. So I don't think we which is classic TV. Yep. Mm-hmm. And yep. Um, yes. if you get decades you can apparently at midnight you can watch it and this is the this is the thing i mean it spawned three different motion pictures several um re re reenactments you know they've done the and tell new stories and bring new characters to the surface and give them stories and and so, so there was so much to choose from and you know, they just decided to do, it was like a set piece. Uh, it didn't really have a story. It was just a, a series of kind of wonderful scenes. Mm-hmm. All the people were, I mean, uh, what's her name? What's her name? Green? Uh, name. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 your Angelique counterpart in, uh, in that movie. Eva, Eva, Eva mm-hmm. Green. Yeah, she was yeah. gorgeous. Wonderful, but you know she did what everyone does who plays a witch. She played a witch. Right. <laughs> she played a witchy, witchy witch. Right. <laughs> mean, mean, and does magic and casts spells, and it it's really, really horrible. To everyone, you know. It was yep. a shame yep. that it was changed yep. by the Gulf War because I really wanted to. You know, they only got to the part where they were going to hang Victoria Winners, and then it just left us there. Uh, no, um, Laura, yeah. Laura's, Laura's talking about the Tim Burton film. Oh, the Timber film. Yeah. I was talking yeah, about yeah. the 91 series. Yeah. No, they did Well, yeah, there were a lot of stories that were left hanging because, you know, there were new writers would be bright, brought in and they'd have new ideas. And it, the interesting thing about being on a soap was uh, they start to write to your, what would you say, your... Your strengths. Your, your strengths, exactly. That's the best word, yeah. Mm-hmm. They see what you can do best, and so then you and the writing begin to, to meld. And you, you know, more and more, I began to see scenes that I knew I could do really well because they they figured out what I could do, and that was true of everyone. And you know, well, and Josette, Josette was not without her faults too. Yeah, I mean, she right, was the right. she was the pure heroine, but she was naive, mm-hmm. and she was vain. And um, she had, of course, she had this the sense of, of of an aristocrat that things should be going her way. Right. And you know, she was something of a snob, although <laughs> she tried very hard not to be. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, it was a delicate, complicated performance that Catherine Lee Scott gave, mm-hmm. and that you know made her extremely appealing. Sure. And yet, you know, she you wanted her to. I don't know, get a little Angelique in her, you know. <laughs> I know, it's just like show her fight. You know, just like don't get a little go, fight. Don't fight. <laughs> well, I have to sit there and say the role of Josette is kind of difficult because you got to remember before prior yeah. to seeing her, I mean, she's kind of mentioned, you know, from the very beginning, Josette, that goes to Josette all the way through. And to actually, like, see her in the flesh, it must have been really hard to, like, come up with all this expectations about how do I play this part, so... I think Catherine really <laughs> reacted herself because, you know, you know, I mean, Josette was mentioned for a good mm-hmm. year before they even showed her. <laughs> so it's like, it's like the ghost of Josette, the, the secret of Josette. 
Jones was the movie, uh, the second movie, and uh, you had the mm-hmm. you had the starring role there, or one of the starring roles, and you got to play Angelique on the screen. Mm-hmm. What were your reminiscences about uh, that movie? Well, um, oh, silly things like white chiffon dress because I was a ghost. Mm-hmm more than a witch. Mm-hmm. And I was sprinkled all over. You said the characters, spr- you know, sparkle in the sunlight. Right. Well, I had <laughs> sparkles, sparkle stuff all over me. You were sparkly. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and heavy makeup and a very complicated hairdo. And, and, you know, I sat around all day and didn't film. She doesn't show up very much in the movie. So, but I had to keep everything clean. <laughs> I, I remember you, that when you when y'all I, I noticed that the whoever your hairstylist was and and the the soap opera was they were fantastic. Was that was that your hair? Was that all of your hair? Or something? No, or they wigged. No, the, all that stayed at the studio. <laughs> oh my god! So no, those were all hair. Awesome. They were all hair pieces. Oh my god! They were. They yeah, looked so. A- like yours and I, was like, that's I well weird. that's the magic of oh magic of God. movies so no in that period of time too uh, everybody right. had a fall if you mean you just, you just had one <laughs> and mine was very long and luxurious and um so if you wanted to have long luxurious hair you just can kind of stick it underneath your own hair in the back and there you there are, you are. So they would put the, they would put these these falls into curls and and uh it made it a whole lot easier. You didn't have to have your hair styled every day. Right. Wore, wore all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And this is true. I mean, for instance, Broadway, none of, none of those women are wearing their own right. hair. They're all wearing wigs. Mm-hmm. But they look really good, don't they? Yes. And yes. Game of Thrones. Yes. You, I mean, you've, you've watched Daenerys on her hair. Haven't you on Game of Thrones? I love Game of Thrones. It's Actually, very common. She, she's not even yeah. on, so. Game of Thrones has, <laughs> Game of Thrones has a lot in common with Dark Shadows. Hmm. There's a lot of magical realism. Right. And there's a lot of, huge amount of conflict. And the characters flip. You know, they're, right. they have two sides. They all have a dark side. You know, they all bring about their fate in ways that, you know, you could only blame them. And uh, and it's wonderful drama. Gosh, it's great. Yeah. In between dark shadows. I just finished watching. Sorry. What? Uh, I just what? finished watching the entire series. I watched it in three weeks. Yeah. It's of Game of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Perfect show to binge watch with. So. Uh huh. Well, I was going to query, like in between dark shadows, when Angelique would come and go off the program. I realized that you actually did a lot of other stuff in between uh, playing the part of Angelique. One being p- working with Brian De Palma and Robert De Niro in Hi Mom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like, Brian De Palma oh, in yeah. those days? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think I sort of disappointed him. He put all these bubbles around me. And in, in the scene, I was supposed to tell my sexual fantasies. So I was trying to come up with sexual things and get it off my face. I remember sitting there looking in the mirror thinking, I've ruined my life. I'll never get this terrible stuff off me. It's blackface. Oh, no. Um, You know, I I can't, I can't, you know, I can't. Brian De Palma's brilliant, wonderfully talented guy. But this was hard because, uh, you know, we didn't have any lines. We had to improvise. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and he, was, you know, he wanted us guys, weren't they? Before he um, went all to Alfred Hitchcock, but most of his early films, I believe, were all kind of improvised at the beginning of his career. Who's who's Brian De Palma's early part of his career? I think all, most of all of his early films are improvised. Which really, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, it was the experimental. You know, people were into doing things very differently and see if they could see if it worked, see if they could get away with it, and this was. This was what this movie was, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then you did a movie called Save the Tiger. What was your? Exp- what was that like? Did you- Jack Lemmon? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that was that was marvelous opportunity. Um, very very wonderful part, and uh, I was still living in New York, and I came out here to, to Los Angeles, and I had two days of filming uh, in a hotel downtown hotel. And because it was a very emotional scene, 
the scene with the, where she plays the prostitute, um, I did a lot of preparation. I mean, I spent hours up there by myself when everyone else went to lunch. Doing the preparation for the scene where the guy has a heart attack. So I worked really hard on it, you know. I tried very hard to... But the story of my audition was interesting because... Uh, well, it was directed by John Avelson. And he... Um, he In the audition, he invited me up to um, uh, um, Upper East Side, an apartment on the Upper East Side, because he said he wanted to shoot some film to send it to to California to see if I'd be right for the part. And the scene he wanted to film was a scene where I was talking on the telephone. And I, I, I went there with my jewelry and my makeup and some clothes that I thought might be right for the, for the scene. And I got there and John Avelson was there and another couple was there. I had no idea who they were, a man and a woman. And he gave me some marijuana and I thought, you know, I should be cool. I should be cool. I should, I should smoke a little because I don't, you know, I don't want to seem like an idiot. So I had a little puff and then he took me into this living room area and they were both standing there watching. I didn't know who they were. They kind of creeped me out. And he said, what I want you to do is I want you to take the telephone line which was one of those curly telephone lines. Right. Oh, yeah. Remember those? Oh, yeah. oh my yeah. God, yeah. The old telephones. Yep. And he said, I, mean, I just want you to pull it back and forth on the inside of your thigh while you're talking on the okay. phone. <laughs> he said, "Take, t reach down with your left hand and pull the telephone cord back and forth on the inside of your thigh. And I started to, uh, you know, pose for the they're still photographs I guess and all of a sudden I thought this is an orgy <laughs> that's what's really happening here yeah. this is an orgy yeah. those other two people are in on it oh and my goodness I don't know what's going to happen but I got to get out of here exactly mm -hmm. <laughs> so I stood up I, I was wearing I was wearing a, a slip I was wearing underwear no shoes and my jewelry was in my makeup case. And I stood up and I walked out the door and I walked down the stairs in my underwear. Oh my God. And I stuck out my hand and you know, New York, zip taxi, bingo. I was in the taxi. <laughs> well, and I went home. woman in a slip looking for a taxi. Hello. <laughs> I, I went home right. and I left everything. I left everything. I. Uh, so my husband went back and got it, but oh my god! You know, a week later they called me up and told me I had the part. I mean, oh my god! <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Oh my god! How funny! Uh, and then we go to do the scene, and there's a gorgeous black model. She I, she might have been Iman, but you know she could have been someone. Right. And she, she's standing there in the scene, watching the scene that I have with this who's the John, I'm playing a prostitute, who's the John, and he's, he's had a heart, heart attack. And I'm trying to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And I'm terrified that you know, I've killed this guy. And she's standing there with this bemused look on her face. So we shoot the scene, and then John Avelson says, I want to shoot this something with you two girls. He said, I just want you to kiss and, you know, stroke each other and embrace each other. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can tell the story because John Avelson's dead now. But you know this this, <laughs> this experience is you know when you're a young actress, you are so vulnerable right. to so many other you know the fantasies that guys have that you know that you, you just knowing what to do, you don't know what to do. But I do remember walking out the door and down the street and hopping in a taxi. <laughs> This is an orgy. I have to get out of here. <laughs> but but another role that you had, and I and I was, uh, we were talking about that, Laura, um, where I just happened to come across Kung Fu by accident, and I said I never watched it before, mm -hmm. so let me. And you're in the first episode, and uh, yeah. uh, be you know, uh, acting uh, with David Carradine as a. Uh -huh. 
as a widow in the old west, uh, replete mm -hmm. the replete with the garb and uh, and the. Let him out of the box. He hops up on the fence and crows. Works like a charm. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they had they had a horse a horse wrangler and they got the horses to do great stuff and. Oh, I was in a Western. Oh, I was so thrilled. I loved it. I just been, I just came, I just come to Hollywood. I'd only been here about two weeks and I got that part. <laughs> That's so Wonderful. fantastic. I saw you were on the soap opera Capitol. I used to watch that religiously when I was young. My, my oh, I know. Was, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to place your character on it. Covered the, your, your eye teeth with right. bigger teeth, with vampire teeth. And it was very easy to just slip in your mouth. I mean, you could turn away from the camera, slip it in, turn back, you were a vampire. Worked like a charm. No, so I used great. that on, on Battle Scarred. Well, I actually did. I used it on the Carson show when I did the Carson show, and I bit <laughs> Johnny Carson. That was fun. <clears throat> no, it's very tough to find an actual uh, video of that Johnny Carson appearance. I know. Now. I was just sitting there trying to figure out how to find it. Is. I've been looking for it for years, but it, but it's known among the fandom, uh, and uh, and that would have been that must have been hilarious to you know to, to have him. You know, I could not believe how well it worked because you know you have no idea if you can make it work. Mm -hmm. But you know, he said, "What's it like?" You know, and I said, "Well, do you want to do the scene with me?" And he was game. You know, mm -hmm. he stood up. And I had the teeth in my hand, right, <laughs> ready. And I, uh, I said, "Come to me for comfort. I need you. You cannot resist me." And he, he did this, you know, spitting eye thing, and got tons of laugh, laughs, you know. And uh, I embraced him, and I said, "I guess I said turn, turn your back to the camera." I don't know. I whispered something. And he turned around so that my back was to the camera. Oh, because then he could, you know, he could mug and do all kinds of things. And I slipped in the teeth and we turned back around again. I guess I was dancing him around. And there I was. And I bit down on Johnny Carson's neck. Oh, no. And he, and he spun around three times and did a pratfall. <laughs> and it was just, it just was great and I was good I was standing there oh no 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 what have I done <laughs> but uh, no it, it, it just it just came off per you know a few things have worked that well came mm. off perfectly I hope they do find it because it's very cute I want to mention one of my favorite movies that you did which is Race with the Devil and I really yeah. love this one with Peter Fonda and um, Loretta yeah. What was your experiences doing that film? Because that was quite a dark... I remember when it came on television, my mom wouldn't let me see it because I was too young, but, um, <laughs> but I made sure... I, I kind of sat on the banister and like looked down the stairs and watched it from that view. And I, mm -hmm. I own it on Blu-ray and everything, and I do watch it about once a year, so I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, really? Yeah, but... Uh, what do you that. think of the ending? I like the, I like dark-sided endings. I think that they make the film more memorable than happy-go-lucky mm -hmm. endings. You know, because exactly. there's really yeah. no way for you to get out of the situation. And I thought it was quite a naturalistic ending. And it did, that's what is the ending that horrified me. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think that your dog deserved it, but hey. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, well, I, my character is named Kelly. Hmm. And I think Kelly was once, was present and she could, she was able to see that there was something supernatural going on where the doesn't <laughs> denying it. Then they could have had a sequel. Yeah, it was it was it was great fun. It was wonderful fun, and you know the 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 scene with snakes was really fun. I mean, it was like a, it was just a dream to be able to do a scene with three rattlesnakes, mm -hmm. <laughs> and half the crew were were, were not there. Loretta Swit wouldn't come on the set, so I got all her lines. <laughs> oh, people are terrified of snakes, and what they what they did is they they milked them. Like they hooked the fangs yeah. over a glass yeah, yeah, and then so pressed milk, pre to yeah. milk the poison out. And then they pulled the fangs and then they sewed their mouths closed. Yeah. So that there was just an opening for the tongue to come out. So the tongue could come out and slither. But it was obvious the snake couldn't bite you. And it was, you know, had to kill the snake with a ski pole. And the snake just lay there. They couldn't get it to strike. You know, they, they had to come back several hours later and try to 
get the snake to do something that looked lethal. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it was it was it was fun. It was fun. It was a we had a good time doing that film. It was uh, you know it was pretty straightforward, and we spent every scene in the in the trailer, the big uh, <laughs> motorhome. Mm. Yeah. You were one life to live too. Another one of my favorite shows back in the day. Oh, I know. Another one. I said, I just said, why don't you give me a story? You know, I, I, yeah, I thought, just guy? think, I could, be, I could be, I could be on this show for the next five years and make tons of money, and no kidding, and all my fans would watch it. <laughs> been a lot more than that. You know, Laura, getting back to dark shadows, there was one thing that I wanted to ask you about, and that was. The way they finally dealt with the Angeli character, which was after all the storm and drong of the Barnabas Angelique, I, I hate you, I love you, like this, like that. And then all of a sudden, at the very end, Barnabas realizes that he really loved Angelique after all. Um, if you remember in the 1840s. Uh, Day late and a dollar short. And <laughs> yeah. One, Oh, the fans were like, oh, my God, after all this, and he loves her. After all, what's wrong with him? <laughs> I know. I'm sure that was very frustrating to the fans. We, you know, we had nothing to do with it. We just, oh, of, uh, course, of course, of course, yeah. You know, it's just, you, you get the job. script, you learn the lines, you play the scenes. That's what it's like. You know, it's you a job. You, you did what you did. Exactly. Um, yeah, Absolutely. But that certainly didn't detract from the, uh, and it's a tribute uh, to the acting abilities, I think, of both of you, that, e that even though that little plot line occurred, and that was a bit of a bump, but it did not detract from the overall performance that the two of you gave over the years. Well, the little triangle with Angelique, Josette, and, and Barnabas, you guys had massive chemistry. Yep. Yeah, you know, yeah we for, did. For all that, yeah. I mean, you just all just fell into it beautifully. I mean, made it believable. And, you know, y'all just were just so on cue with each other. It was just been fantastic. I love rewatching it all. I, I, was, I was watching The Vampire Curse um, on Amazon Prime. It was like three hours of, you know, the episodes mm -hmm. and how he turned into mm -hmm. a vampire. And I just love mm -hmm. those episodes because I just love how y'all interacted. And you guys were just like spot on all the time. It was just amazing work you all did together. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. That's very nice of you to say that. Oh, it's true. Some days were better than others. <laughs> no, well, like with anybody else. Now, it looks like you did a lot of, um, you, you had your um, Broadway debut in 1968 in A Woman Is My Idea. And um, in 1969, you also played the title role to, in another off-Broadway production of Lulu. Um, so, did obviously, you must have fit those in on your off times of Dark Shadows, or were you doing Dark Shadows during the day and doing the theater at night? Thing that led up to her becoming a witch. So you know what happens with a first, first effort, is so much of your life and so much of your background, and so much of your aesthetic taste, goes into it. I mean, many of the stories of Angelique were actually things that happened to me, and I, you know I changed them to make them her. And but I think that I looked a long time for someone who could be a model because I realized I. I couldn't write like Dickens. I couldn't write like Henry James. I couldn't write like, you know, the great writers. And then I came across a book by Daphne du Maurier, who wrote Rebecca. And sometimes, it, somehow it seemed like an accessible style. I mean, right. I saw the way that she did a lot of um, description, a lot of scene description, a lot of trying to put you in the atmosphere of the place. And so I just kind of started, and I, my editor, who was, you know, I'd send her, she said, I want you to send me 50 pages every month or so. And she said, you know, there's an awful lot of description, there are an awful lot of metaphors, and, you know, there's, there's alliteration, and, and there's, right, right. there's symbolism, and there's, she said, she said, you're kind of overwriting, you're just, she said, pull it back, pull it back, she says, it's, she said, you know, a metaphor is like, an, you know, it's like jewelry. You, you don't need five necklaces. Just one necklace is enough. And so I thought, well, you know, that's true. I, in, in trying so hard to put my point across and to write, I really did want to write beautifully. I wanted to write poetically. I thought, you know, I, I, I set myself very high goals because I didn't want them to take the book away and give it to someone else. And she was, um, she was really happy with it. 
And she led me along, and she knows she's. And I think the other reason the fans love this book is because about two thirds of the way through, it sinks into the dark shadow story. So that's all familiar. They know the whole thing that's happening. But it's all told from Angelique's point of view. So you get to see what she's thinking and, and, and the decisions she's, she makes, which, you know, you don't get to see when you watch TV. You just get to hear the lines. You don't get to hear, see what she's thinking. But in a novel, you can hear, you can write with what someone's thinking. So, and then they said they wanted me to do another one. And, um, that the this same time operation? it wasn't going to be mass market. You know, the first one was mass market. Right. So, um, you know, that's just that little tiny throwaway that doesn't cost very much to print. Right. And they said, we're going to do, we went, it was so successful. It sold so many copies that they wanted to do another one. So I went to graduate school. <laughs> I said, okay, I got to, I got to get serious about this. So I went to graduate school and I master's in creative writing and I studied writing for two and a half years while I was writing the Salem branch. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found my theme, which is, which is, you know, the thing I hate the most, which is hypocrisy, especially right. in the hands of the powerful people who manipulate the innocent and the uneducated, and you know, tempt them into being what they would not be, and forcing them to follow a prescriptive set of values that they resist, but they can just the whole idea of hypocrisy and racism, prejudice, those are the, I think those are the ideas that intrigue me the most in the political scene. And of course, it's very important today to keep in mind that our country is divided by these, these same problems. And um, so it was my way of kind of tying into the present day culture. And so, and, and then I realized research has, is, is a great source of material. So in Angelique's Descent, of course, I was able to research the, 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 the sugar plantations in the Caribbean and the blacks, how, how they were tortured and how they died and how they struggled in the, and then the rebellions, which were marvelous, the race mm-hmm. rebellions. And, you know, the ships that were carrying the slaves to the, all, all of that stuff just worked really well. So then I got to Salem Branch and I realized that I could go back to the Salem Witch Trials and it's just, just so much material. You can actually read the trials themselves. You can read I know. What, Isn't that the, fantastic? Yeah. So I just put all that stuff in my book. <laughs> I just, you know, I just put it in and the, you know, the horrible hypocrisy of the, Oh God, yes. The, the pastors, yeah, and they, you know, the devil is among us, and they, you know, they hung seven, they hung dogs, they hung seventeen women. I mean, it was just so bizarre, and um, and I thought, which was really one of the best ideas I've ever had. What if there really was a witch mm-hmm. who was terrified? They would find out she was a witch. Who was terrified? They would find out she could fly. <laughs> Who was terrified they would find out that she could cast spells, that she could bring, you know, sheep who had frozen in the snow back to life. Right. And so I loved this idea of someone who, and then I thought, why couldn't she be the first original ancestor of Angelique? Because we did, we went back and, you know, we went back in time many times and the same actors would just play characters that were them in another time. Mm-hmm. which is great fun. I mean, it's like a summer stock um, cast. We, you know, we never knew what we're getting. We would, we'd be a whole different person at another time. So that was just great. And I just thought, I'm going to make Miranda, who was the witch in the Salem branch, she was the original Angelique. Angelique and uh, this is how she became a witch. And, then, you know, in the end, they hang her. So uh, because they, figure, they find out she's a witch and they hang her. It's so sad so that was just times historically because what they didn't understand, and most of these women were healers. I mean, oh God, this, it was just the his, history to it is just if you really get into the, the the trials and you realize what these people did, it's far much worse than reading the Crucible. <laughs> <laughs>
No, it is. It's just fascinating. They were, but often they were, what they really were, were landowners who were not married. Uh And they wanted their land. Mm -hmm. And so they, all they had to do was accuse them of being witches so they could hang them, then they could get land. And, you know, they were all going through menopause and, you know, they were crazy. Yeah. And acted crazy, and so they acted like they were witches. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's have just it's so supplements back then. <laughs> yeah, right, right, and and uh, I don't know, and I and just the whole thing about the Indians. I mean, it was great to be able to research how the Indians lost their land and how they lost their right. no, you know, their noble, their nobility, and the great idea of stories and how the Indians told stories. I mean, it's just wonderful possibilities in research and you know all these ideas come to you from from your research that would never have occurred to you and you just weave them into the story so then when i got to um then when i got to wolf moon rising it was it was the 20s i took i took all my characters back to the 20s which was really fun because star shadows had never been in the 20s someone gave me an idea wouldn't it be fun if you could go back, flap her, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. And I thought, it's an insane idea, you know? What was she like? And, uh, well, yeah, I mean, and, the, you know, the fact that the wealthy people all had had uh, plenty of liquor and, and you'd be put in jail if you, if anybody found you with liquor. So, it's, again, it was that that hypocrisy that, you know, seems so prevalent between the upper classes and the lower classes. And and then, you know, God, you just find such great stuff. I remember reading that they used to hide the the, the bottles of liquor in, in, in caskets and oh. then put them into the, you know, put them into, into the vaults, into graves. And I went, okay, <laughs> here's a scene, you know, here's a scene. They're going, they're trying to find the liquor. They open the casket. Guess who's in the casket? Exactly. Part of us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just fell right into place. It was, it was, and it was, it was a very, very colorful period. So it was fun describing, um, David, grown, you know, grown up into a young man in love with the girl next door, and they go back in time in this fabulous Duesenberg, this car that takes him back to the twenties, and and then they 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 live there, mm-hmm. uh, s- searching for a portrait. Anyhow, um, Wolf Moon Rising is a very complicated book. It's four stories woven together, so it's a lot. It's a lot more like the show. Mm-hmm. You know, the show would always have three or four stories going, so every episode. You know, you'd move into one story, and then you'd go into another story, and then you go into another story, and you'd do that week after week after week. One would get resolved, and a new one would begin. But it was that kind of episodic feeling that there was always so, you know, three or four plots going on at once. In fact, the famous story um, that Jonathan told, uh, uh, may rest in peace, was about the fact that during the 1897 storyline, it got so complicated that the writers actually went out into the street because they didn't remember what was going on. So they were looking for the fans outside the studio and actually <laughs> yeah, asked them. They know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That actually happened. They asked the fans, oh, Yo, yeah, don't you remember? Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And so that, that, that was, that's marvelous. That's really marvelous. Well, you know, we have a convention every year. At least we did until a couple of years ago. Every year for 50 years. Uh-huh. And the fans inevitably in the Q and A sessions, all the actors would be up on stage, 20, 25 actors. And a fan would stand up and say, you know, in that scene where you had, you had that, that, that pin yeah. that, that, you know, that Barnabas had, you remember when you, you turned around and, and you said that, why did you say that? <laughs> you know, it's just be such, such a, we just double up with laughter. We go, honey, we don't remember anything. <laughs> You're the ones that remember it. And then someone would raise their hand and they'd have the answer. <laughs> so, well, they don't you know, forget, that's, that's for sure. It's Fans, amazing. Oh, I know. I mean. Well, let's not forget the Paley event that was uh, this past April. Uh, and I think that was great to uh, celebrate the Master of Dark Shadows DVD. The Master of Dark Shadows. This is the new documentary. That's correct. It's right. been put out. 
on Dan Curtis, and it is extreme, it's very enjoyable for the fans of Dark Shadows. Mm. But it also makes it very clear that, you know, he went on to do things that were, mm. oh, God, you know, yeah. Emmy winning material, you know, The Winds of War and War and Remembrance. And, oh, gosh, and uh, yeah. all these people talk about him, and, you know, in such mm-hmm. glowing terms. He was, he was, you know, highly respected and, uh, he did. He did some wonderful TV. Really, some wonderful TV. And yes. and uh, and he, you know, he he used to say he we you know hoped he'd move beyond Dark Shadows. But you know, the fact that he brought so many different elements into Dark Shadows is why it mm-hmm. still intrigues people. They still love watching it. It's. Mm-hmm. it's well, it stood uh, the it, test it, of time, and it will and it, can, it will continue to do so. I believe. Yeah, I think, I really think it's just, I think somebody really smart is going to say, hey, let's do this again. This time, let's do it right. Yeah, I hope so. And let's, you know, let's keep the tone. Because even the vampire TV shows, you know, they tend to be a little... um, Anemic? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, overly bloody. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I think. Well, you know, it, I also think that it's quite a, strange if you what? had Angelique and um, Barnabas. I don't think you would have had Buffy the Vampire Slayer because they took a lot from the Dark Shadows. That whole, you know, she falling in love with the vampire, but she, you know, but she, you know, she's, you know, and that whole. If you look at the, oh, Buffy was wonderful. Buffy was the, wonderful. Yeah, it's like. It's like present so, day horror when instead of a, a yeah. castle, you know, you have a house down the street, just like everybody else's house. Yeah. <laughs> and if, you look at, if you look at Buffy, it is done like a soap opera or a daytime drama. Yeah. Right. The way everything yeah. Together. So. Yeah. But, you know, there's a, there's a romantic element. Mm-hmm. You know, there's an element of the 19th century mm-hmm. that uh, has so much power because gothic romance was you know it was it was very romantic by romantic we mean idealized stories with a supernatural element Mm -hmm. so you put those two things together which is the supernatural which is ghosts really do exist Mm -hmm. and so do witches and people you know get out of their graves and walk around and you you put that together with the kind of romantic concept of something like Wuthering Heights or Jane Eyre or any of the great um, fiction of the 19th century and you get a potent combination and it's 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 serious you know it has a the strength of reality to it but it's also romantic very romantic and I think our hearts yearn for romance we want to we want to experience we want to believe there's such a thing as love that lasts that goes beyond death and 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 maybe there is and you know there's a there's there's very long been a the concept that there's a difference between horror and terror have you ever heard that yes (laughs) you know terror is what takes place in the imagination and i mean this is even pointed out over two centuries ago by people who wrote about how do you write scary stories? What makes a story scary? Well, you know, if you have, if you have a lot of screaming and blood, I guess that's scary, right? But when you yeah. see something like that, you kind of pull away from it. You go, ugh, I'm just going to, ugh, I don't want to really watch that. But when you see terror, uh, it takes place in your imagination. Mm. So instead of you know, mouths filled with blood and teeth and people screaming and their heads falling <laughs> off and their, you know, their skin peeling off. And <laughs> you hear a sound down the hall. And, you know, the heroine wakes up and there's a scratching on the window. Mm. And, you know, that's when the hair stands up on your arm and the shivers go down your spine. And you know there's something out there, but you don't know what it is. It's and that's terror. The psychological. Yes, and it's it's a higher form of of writing. It's a higher form of literature. It always has been considered a higher form. It's like the difference between pornography 
and a love story. I mean, when you watch pornography, I guess it gets you turned on, but you also kind of curl up, you know, and pull away. Whereas when you watch a love story, you enter into it right. and you become part of it and you identify with the characters mm -hmm. and you, you believe that you are in that story with them. It's a, just a different kind of writing and that's what Dark Shadows had. Mm -hmm. For all of its failings, you know, all of its, um, the bloopers and the, the times we forgot our lives and, and there was still, it, there was, it was, <laughs> What? I was watching What'd you say? the episode of, I believe it was Joan Bennett was trying to get out of the doors and the main, the door was stuck and she couldn't get out. <laughs> she couldn't get the door open? She actually got the door open. Oh, yeah. Open. But it was, oh, yeah. And then you saw the boom come down a couple times and every once in a while you'd hear somebody whisper in the background, you know, like. You, like or someone run across the background. And then I have a, you know, I have a great story of one time where I had to cast a spell. I was going to start a fire in Vicky's room. So already we were into chroma key, which is superimposing one scene over another, which was a tricky thing they used to do back then. And so we were going to have fire. We we're going to put the fire in Vicky's room and scare her to death. So well, I had to create this fire. Three winters, that poor woman. <laughs> yeah, I know. Anyhow, I had to. What I had to do was build a house of cards and set it on fire. How they expected me to do this, <laughs> I don't know. But I took these cards and I actually built this little house, cut to commercial, come back. I have an incantation, which is I call on the fires of hell. I call on the, the, the king of night. You know, the, I call on the darkness. Burn, burn, burn. I and saw I take that a yesterday. Paper. I just watched that yesterday. Did you see this? Did you yeah, see this one? Calling in all the big guns. <laughs> oh, yeah, this long incantation, which I was oh reading off God. the teleprompter. Yeah, Barnabas so then I was supposed to light I know, the house of cards. He was trying to figure out what yeah. was yeah. <laughs> clueless that you were in there. Burn, burn. <laughs> But by then it was only ashes because what happened was during the commercial, the prop guy squirted the house of cards with lighter fluid. And <laughs> yeah, it was another know. commercial. And he, you know, he kind of thought better of it. He came in back and he squirted the house of fire, the, the house of cards with more lighter fluid. So we come back from the commercial and I'm doing the incantation and I put the taper to the cards. And of course they just exploded and burned to the ground immediately. And I had nothing to say. I had no fire. <laughs> said the, said the, I was going, burn, burn, burn. I was picking up the ashes. <laughs> and that kind of thing happened. You know, it, it, it happened so many times that, you know, we just look back on these, these experiences and we laugh because it, it, that was one of the things that endeared the show to the exactly. fans. Exactly. That's the fact. what I was going to say. It, it made Part it more memorable. And we love the characters that much more, especially when things like that happen. Oh, yeah, you feel like you're in on it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, especially when, well, I mean, when you're, you're you're younger, like, my mother wouldn't let me watch Dark Shadows. I had to, like, like go slip into the room and watch it with my brothers because she said it would scare me. But, but um, I mean, it was just... It could be very scary, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess it was rather intense for, you know, but, I mean, people would run home from school to watch it. My brothers did. Like That's I said, right. They had massive crush on you. You know, I told my brothers that I was we were going to be interviewing you, and they're just like, "Oh my God, they still have a crush on you." <laughs> <laughs> well, that is so great. That makes me so happy to hear that. <laughs> well, and I myself, well, it was just a job. We were just working very hard. We were all very young, and uh, oh, we Laura, worked very hard. Laura, could you yeah. tell that story about the subway when you got on the subway once, uh, and the kids? Saw you. Do you remember that? I, I heard about that. I thought that was great. Well, yeah, we were so we were recognized everywhere we went, and it was it's was kind of a shock because you don't think that you've done anything to be recognized, but everybody was terrified of my character. <laughs> and if I if if I would if I'd be on the subway platform when school let out, and they would recognize me. They would scream and run to the other end of the platform. <laughs> I mean, people believe you are the person they see on TV. Mm. Not anymore, because I think we're more sophisticated. But back then, you know, I got hate letters. You leave Barnabas alone or I'm going to poison you. <laughs> oh, my you know, God. Are you kidding me? I'm going to get a knife and I'm going to go to the studio and I'm going to kill you. Oh you, start, you stop doing that to Barnabas. 
Oh you know, what am I supposed to do? People take that soap opera <laughs> stuff seriously. They're, they're reality kind of like Ben's. Well, I think in those, yeah. in those days they did think they were real. I mean, you, I think, you know, you'd hear stories from, you know, other soap opera actresses where they'd be attacked in supermarket, got to the point where they couldn't leave the house if, if they were like a villainous a character. Villain. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I'm not, I'm not the only one that yeah. and they got fans to turn against them. <laughs> but Angelique was pretty bad from time yeah, to time. Yeah, she was, yeah. You were an intense character. You had a lot of, you've had a lot of, you were Spitfire, though. I mean, you just didn't take no crap. I mean, <laughs> you were good. You were gonna- well, I've, you know, I've had people, in, again, at the conventions come to me and say, and, you know, fans tend to be basically recluse people mm-hmm. sometimes they are people right. that um you know have a nerdy quality not all of them but yeah. you know they know every single line every word every character they right and i'm not just talking about dark shadows i'm talking about you know star trek and game of thrones i mean fans are fans relish the fact that they really know the show they love really really well mm-hmm. I know and they love talking about it with one another mm-hmm. And I used to have fans, I mean, come up to me and say, you know, you got me through my adolescence. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have you because you were an example of someone who stood up for herself and you had powers and you could make people sorry if they hurt you. And I love that so much because, you know, they would say when I was an adolescent, when I was in high school, it, you know, I was so miserable. And I felt so out of it. I felt so lonely. I felt so, felt like an outcast, you know, because because I was gay or because I wasn't, you know, pretty or because I, you know, I was so shy or because I was, you know, my parents were divorced or just a number of reasons. And I could I could watch Dark Shadows and I could watch your character and you had so much strength. And I believed that you, you know, that you can make people really sorry if they hurt you. And I just thought, yeah, that's great. Of course, I had no idea that I was having this effect on anyone. You know, I was just doing your job, learning the lines and playing the scenes. I know. But I'm going to a- try that house of card thing on my ex-husband and see if that works. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you can make a doll and you can stick pins in it. So maybe it'll work. <laughs> I know. I mean, that was just so simple. You just took the pins and, you know, and poor Sarah. You know, I, li- I live up in a, I live up in a canyon, and um, you you really can't pass because there's so many curves. Yeah. But I every know. once in a while, some asshole will be behind me, and uh, <laughs> he'll pull out and go around, you know, and he'll just barely keep from hitting a, an oncoming car right. or he'll go around and he'll kick me, cut me off and speed off in his Porsche or something. And I, I always go, I hold on to the steering wheel and I look at it and I go, I hope you die. I hope you die. <laughs> I hope you go off the road. I hope you go off the road and I hope your car burns and you suffer. You suffer horribly. <laughs> and if that person ever saw dark shadows and saw you behind the car there looking, I tried to leave me I know, just like, I just cut off Angelique. <laughs> it really would be wonderful if I could keep really cast spells. It really would be. <laughs> if it's any consolation, what you do behind the wheel of the car, I do every day on my way to work, so don't worry. I've killed so yep. many people. Yep, life. I know. <laughs> I know, road rage is big in L.A., I'll tell you. It is be careful. in Dallas, too. It's awful. Yeah, yeah. I have two. Well, well, is not too, not, too, not too great either. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. so I guess it's a worldwide uh, phenomenon. And Laura, yeah, and Laura then, we do hope you, I, I do hope you write again. Uh, I think that uh, you know the really the, yeah the four novels you wrote a book of short stories too, if I recall correctly. Oh no, I'm work I'm working on a book of short stories. I'm trying oh. to become more literary, which mm-hmm. is uh, you know, dark shadows is what you would call in the writing world genre, which is. You know, it's horror, so it's, it's vampire stories, basically. Right. Uh, I don't know uh, if I'll write another dark... It, you know, it takes years yeah. to write a novel. It's, and I'm not very disciplined. You know, if I, if I got up every morning and wrote for four or five hours, I'm sure I could crank one out a lot faster. Yeah. But because I spend a lot of time on them, I think they have a lot of layers. 
and you know things happen in my life or things you know I, I remember things or I read about things and I work them in and you know the last one was really fun because I was able to uh, the heiress of Collinwood I was able to explore Vicky's character and give saw, her a spine for the first I time. You know, she, read those. I saw those. It's like, oh, wow, I don't have those. So I'm going to get them on my Kindle. <laughs> well, I read, I've actually and read. I don't, yes, and I also, it. yeah, I read the first, I read the first three on Audible. I saw that So too. that makes it, that makes it, um, you know, a little bit easier. You can listen oh, to yes, them in your car. Absolutely. Well, I've read, yeah. I've read, I read your first three books, um, and I really enjoy them. I think basic. I like your. Thank you so much. You have an individual style. Well, you know, it would... really brings everything to life. And I have to, and I think that where a lot of writers have difficulties where you excel in is actually your dialogue is very real. You do real, real good job at real. Oh, thank you. Characters. Well, thank you. Well, I went to school. I got my master's in creative <laughs> writing. Oh, it seems like you spent a lot of time at university. I mean, my goodness. You yeah. But the thing about writing is down. that um, sometimes you got to have that, you know, that natural born talent. They can teach you how to formulate it. You need that natural born talent built in you, which you have. So um, I really. Well, I think it comes from reading. Yeah. You know, um, I've read about, I, I, like Stephen King says that the first thing he does in the morning is read, mm -hmm. you know, and so does Gabriel Garcia Marquez. He says the first thing he does is he sits down and reads. Mm -hmm. And if you read, even if you just read poetry, you know, what you're doing is you're kind of pulling into your brain how language works yeah. and the power of language. And as you said, the power of alliteration, the power of metaphor and Correct. how you know, you you get kind of in the mood, and you realize the possibilities. You're not just stuck with a blank page. You know, you're, you you fill your mind with beautifully said ideas, and it's and if you don't read, I don't think you can write if you don't read. I mean, I just think that people yeah. need to do a lot of reading, and and that's the one thing I've done. I've just read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of novels, yeah. and you know, I've read a lot of poetry, and I I love it. So, Why and I so admire when it's done well. It just so, it makes me ache. You know, I would love to be able to write like some of the great writers can write. I just think it's. Mm -hmm. it's oh, I think you, I think you've established your own um, personal, and I think it, it's very. I'm I'm in all of your writing. The reason why I'm in all of your writing is I went to university because I wanted to be a writer. So I got my PhD uh -huh. in criminal psychiatry. I got my PhD in journalism, and I wanted to be the next John Irving or someone like John Irving. He's my favorite author. Of course, author. yes. And I tried uh -huh. to write a novel, and I was really, really bad. But what I did excel in, um, which um, my agent was over the joy with, is I could write screenplays. So I was really good at writing screenplays. But I'm really bad at writing a novel. So anyone that can write a novel, I'm in all of it. I. And I really enjoyed your books. I have to sit there saying, I, you know. And you, have you written I'm, some I'm screenplays really that have been optioned? Or yes. What's yeah. happened with your screenplays? Well, I've written um, a, couple, a couple of them have been made. They've done, quite, they've done really well. And I've done some work on television shows in America and things like that. So, yeah, I've, I've done quite well with it. I, I bought a house with my proceeds. So. <laughs> well, you, you could write a novel. Uh, you know, it's just beginning, telling. middle, and end. That's all it is. I know. I'm, 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 rising action, jeopardy, climax. I'm going to try probably when I retire next year. So, yeah, I'm going to be 55. Uh -huh. I'm, early, I'm taking early retirement, so I'm no longer going to be seeing patients anymore. So, I thought maybe but the, the great, the great thing about a novel as opposed to a screenplay, a screenplay, every word has to work. You know, it has to work in terms of it does some work. Mm. So that's why you, you, writing a screenplay is you're you know you you have to be very you have to keep it very very tight and it all has yeah. to be visual. Yeah. In a novel, you know, you can be very discursive. Yeah. You can go off on a long tangent. True. There you go, Keith. In, in your in your character's mind, mm. and it, it just you know it, all it all it means is you look at your page count and it's you know it's jumped ten pages. Mm. Yes. Because <laughs> you got to get to three twenty-five before you can turn it in. Well, so, I always have problems with my descriptive texts. My descriptive text is because I mean, long run-on sentences, and that's that's where my problem lies. The dialogue I'm okay with. It's the it's the descriptive text I have difficulty with. But it's something I would have. Oh, me, you mean you have problems with sentences? Well, yeah, uh, you have to. No, it's, you it's, have to learn how to make a sentence. <laughs> 
Because, I mean, if you, want, if you want to describe anything in a screenplay, you can be really short and sweet and to the point. It's like da-da-da-da-da sort of thing, where you kind of have to make sure that your flow is quite well. And that's where I have difficulty in. Yeah, but everybody is not a, every great novelist is not a descriptive writer. Mm. You know, descriptive writing bores a lot of readers. True. I mean, Hemingway is not a descriptive writer. No. Neither is Stephen King. No, they're much more action. Yeah. Well, Hemingway was, was to keep it all very brief, and, and um, I'm not going to get into that, but like Stephen King is much more action. Yeah. Action and dialogue. You don't have to be descriptive. You don't have to. Go on with your alliteration if you don't want to. I guess it's just because I wanted to be the next John Irving when I want to just overwrite and be accepted for that. <laughs> well, you know, get, you know here's, here's the thing. Get a John Irving book and just start reading it. Yeah. And then look at what he does rather than what he says. Yeah, that's And true. It's, a, it's always a great surprise to realize, oh, that's, that's how he does it, uh-huh. Well, I have a really good story about John Irving. It's quite um, strange, but I, I was offered because I was doing some freelancing for writing for some magazines over here, and he was producing a. Um, he had one of his books being released, and I was sent uh -huh. to interview him. And I said, "I." And the thing is, I don't really get starstruck. I'm quite. I'm quite good at not getting starstruck, but I was actually starstruck over him. So I went to interview. Of course. Him. And he's talking to me now as like basically my mind's going all over the place. And I go and I had to go listen, like, I really hate to do this, but I'm like in all of you and I really can't carry on this conversation. I go, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call my editor and have them send somebody who's a bit more got it together than I do. So what I'm gonna do <laughs> oh, really? I'm gonna do now before, before I embarrass myself and I'm oh. I call my editor, I go, listen, oh. I'm Well, I'm sure you weren't the first. <laughs> you go, I'm really all struck. Well, what he did was, um, my editor calls me back like an hour later. He goes, no, John Irving only wants to do the interview with you, so can you show up at um, the Subway? So I oh, him. really? Oh, he was touched by your your, yeah. your revelation, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was great because he gave me two first editions. My favorite book of his is A Prayer for Owen Meany, and my other favorite book of his is Widow for a Year, and he gave me two first editions signed. And every time he comes to London, he calls up on me and goes, do you want to go out to lunch? So I now do lunch with him when he shows up in London. Like, oh, that's wonderful! Oh, yeah. great! That's, that's great! Great! So now, yeah. I'm, so now I'm not in all of him anymore. I'm still in all of his writing, but now I can treat him like a human being again. <laughs> well, of course you can. Yes. But one other. Yes, story. and I'm sure he has a book on how he does it, doesn't he? Yeah, he did. He did one how, do, how do you write? How do you go from screenplay to novel? And it was based on mm -hmm. work on Cider House Rules. So. Mm -hmm. One thing I was going to say about King, uh, since we were talking about that before, is it's action, but it's also that he includes popular references uh, to current Yes, he does, yes. And I think that really grabbed the fans. That was something I don't think anybody had ever done that before him. Uh, yeah, he's very clever in that respect, yeah. 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 And that way he, he connects it to the present-day culture. Exactly. So that the story makes a comment about the world that you know that you're living in you know and, and yeah. you really feel that you're living in the world of his novel especially his earlier works uh he's when, very good yeah 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 when you when you have something like that um but uh so but well he has not, a, he has a very good book on writing stephen yeah. king does he's got a fantastic mm -hmm. book on writing i know i know i have such wonderful fans i still get so many letters well, that's fantastic it's unbelievable it's just it's I mean, somebody really should bring the show back because it is so well loved, and it well, could easily be well loved again. Characters touched a lot of lives and continue to do so. I know, you know, and that that's just that right there is a gift. So, you know, the, right. One of the things, one of the things that they do now in novels, and they're definitely doing it on television, is you know they they do sex scenes, and now they can describe sex and. Now they can portray sex, but in the 19th century, they couldn't. They couldn't uh, even admit that there was such a thing as sex going on. Right, right. So one of, the thing, one of the things they could do is they could make people sick, and they could just, you know, they could describe at length what it was like to die of, of some horrible disease, like tuberculosis, like Camille, for instance. And they could also, they had these Gothic novels where they have, you know, someone like a vampire. So th what the vampire is, is he's just, he's a, he's a seducer. And the whole, the vampire's bite is, in, it's sex. Mm -hmm. 
Right. You know, it's, Absolutely. it's, Absolutely. it's penetration and it's orgasm and all of these things can be described fully and experienced, but you don't have to admit that it's sex. Right. And I no. think that, I think, it, I think that's what made it so, so titillating that, you know, housewives doing their ironing watched Jonathan Frid bite women and they, they became aroused. You know, they became, they wanted to be him to bite them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very complex when you think about it psychologically. Yeah. And that's it, it, it's very powerful to have these symbols right. for things that cannot be can't be expressed in 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 our culture. Of course, there's not really anything left that can't be expressed. I mean, everything's pretty sort of expressed. Now yeah, that's <laughs> been done, right? So you need to go to back to that kind of way of thinking where it's it's titillating and it's exciting and it's arousing and it's forbidden. It's forbidden. Right. Which means you have to go back to a period where, yeah, and, yeah. And it's not just the and it's not just the Barnabas or the male vampire, the female, the female. Uh, you know, you as Angelique and others, uh, Donna Wandry yeah. as Roxanne, um, and, uh, and and they were uh, it, it, that appealed uh, to a lot of males, male adolescents who felt that they wanted Angelique to be the first, uh, the first. Uh, the first crush or the first love, uh, but there was a victimization kind of thing also that that kind of that kind of led into that and the, a romanticism I think developed. Yes, you're right. Above you're the, right. Yeah, up, above the above the sexual. But when you mix those two, even if the victimization is something that's uh, that could be considered maladjusted in you know in other circles, but when you mix that with the with the sexual, and I think that's because it's exposing the vulnerability, the entire vulnerability of the of the experience that the yes. victim takes, and. People ha liken that to other experiences in their real life where they've been victimized, and they identify exactly. with it, they resonate with it, and I and I think yes. that's that's an important thing. Yes. That's very well put. Yes, that's the, and that's that's what's that's what makes it you know so vivid in our minds. And you know, you just imagine novels were forget forbidden. Women's that husbands for you know you may not read any novels and the. Women used to stick them under their pillows and hide them, you know. <laughs> well, they were still doing about romance. <laughs> well, they were still doing when the Lugosi Dracula came out uh, in 1931. Yeah. And they were showing it in the theaters. They actually had nurses in the theaters because women were fainting when they fainting, saw. Fainting, yes. Fainting. They were fainting. When they saw, you know, uh, Lugosi come, it was it was kind of like the equivalent of the vapors in uh, Victor of the Victorian era, and they actually had nurses in the theaters to take care of these people. Yeah. Uh, Lugosi they, was hot stuff in the 1930s. Gosh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. And, and he changed it. And, you know, it's very, it's very, it's also very Freudian. I mean, Freud wrote yeah. this uh, mm -hmm. this wonderful essay called "The Uncanny." in which he attempted to explain why we are frightened by things we read or things we see in, on the stage or things we see in films. And it's a wonderful essay because it's all about things that have been repressed, mm -hmm. either in our childhood, that end up terrifying us when they come to the surface again. You know, we've, we've, he says it's surmounting. We've surmounted, for instance, children want to return to the womb. It's just fascinating. You should, everybody should read this. Yeah. Children want to go back to where it's like, you know, snugly and warm and safe. Yeah. Plus the idea, yeah. Plus the idea easily of suppressed. You know, you outgrow that. You don't want to go back to your mother's womb anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, that's why I'm gay. the suppressed feeling can give, can give rise to fear and horror. <laughs> and it gets translated in horror movies as claustrophobia. Yeah. But then comes the catharsis and the and, and and the release and that ties into the sexuality as well. Uh it's just what, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, can see you've thought a lot about this too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I've always analyzed why was I you know, I mean you know, there's no doubt that for me the female vampire represented a, sec, a psychosexual uh release so to speak as long as you you know you keep it in check and you don't go on acting out you know that kind of thing but it's a but 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 i think that but in in realizing uh 
you know, why does this exist? And it is not just a few select group of people. This is why the vampire literature has, uh, and the movies and so forth have lasted through the years and why it's still a really, I mean, there was a lull in a little while, for a little while in the set in the eighties, but then that, but then uh-huh. with twilight, it picked up again. And so these are touching upon, I don't know if it's part of Jung's collective unconscious, if you want to. Yes, think it that. is. That's part yeah, of it. There you, go. there you go. And, and, and so, and so this is really proof. Keith, is there an archetype uh, in Jung? Uh, the va- the vampire archetype is uh, I don't know you probably know more about that. No, but there's you know there's the whole idea of that you that the man and the woman bec- are one. You know they're two sides of one thing, and uh-huh. and yeah. you know when you get bitten, you you know you you cleave to that person. You, That's right. That's uh, right. That's right. It's I don't know. Right. I'd have to look for the archetype I mean, for the vampire. But, you I mean, know, I've always I've thought that someone said to me, so. you know, someone said to me once that the most intriguing thing about the vampire is that he's dead. Hmm. And what things that are dead, okay. we, we, we are horrified, we're disgusted by. Hmm. Like, you wouldn't touch a dead mouse, would you? You wouldn't touch a bug that's dead. You'd go, Ugh, get away. Get, get that thing away from me. The whole idea of death, the whole idea of a corpse, you know, that something that was so filled with life is now so still. Yeah. The vampire is also an immortal. That's right. So what he does is he represents, and this is the thing we, we all yearn for, to live forever. You know, we, all, we, we want to go to heaven, right? We, right. It's all religion. Religions are all based on our desire to live forever yeah. or to come yeah. again, to live again. Mm-hmm. Governments are based on it. I mean, it's such an integral idea. Mm. We all want to be immortal, and many people believe that they are. So you take one individual, and you make him the the, the most desirable thing that exists, immortal. And you also make him the thing that we are most disgusted and repulsed by, dead. We're scared of. Mm. So you're drawn to it, and you're and you're terrified of it, and right. you put them both into one human being, and there's artistic tension. Mm-hmm. He represents both of those elements: mm-hmm. the desire to live forever and the fear of death. And not just immortality, and, not just immortality. Noreen Dresser, who was a PhD in English uh, back in the '80s, wrote a very interesting book about uh, her theory. She did actual research, and uh, and and she came up with a very interesting theory. It's not just immortality. Vampires come from old money in the literature. The very yes. uh, they uh, uh, yeah, often they, the aristocracy. Yeah, correct. Correct. Uh, they re- they retain the youth. They have the knowledge of the ages. Uh, yes. Incredibly intelligent, enhanced by <laughs> vampiristic capabilities and super size. And guess what? Vampires are the American dream, because don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They have it all. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And that was the connection. Yeah. Is it no wonder? That a lot of people are, and a lot of people liken that to, um, you know, to their own, uh, to their own lives, and uh, and you know, and wanting to make more money, and wanting to be successful, and wanting to be smart, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a vampire, and, it has, and, and the vampire is already, uh, already uh, handmade. It's already, it's already there, and so, mm-hmm. uh, so, and so that was a very interesting theory. Mm-hmm. Well, he embraces his immortality, and he has lots of money. You're right, and he's often, uh, you know, charming and right. intriguing. But he's also trapped yeah. in his his curse because everything comes for you know, so, Yeah, well, that, that's right. Well, that was the thing that Jonathan tapped on that other right. roles had not, uh, yeah. and and that was that kind of completed it. And uh, yeah. his, his was the model. And if you now have other, uh, you know, like the Twilight ones, you know, and if you now have other models, it was all based on his portrayal. So this brings us to the end of our um, conversation with Laura Parker as we discussed her fabulous career. So I want to take this time to thank you, Laura, for joining us on the Literary License Podcast. Oh, you're so welcome. I enjoyed it so much. And of course, if you um, subscribe to our newsletter at www.llpodcast.com, we will make sure you have all the information how to connect with Laura through social media or through her website and also where to buy all her books and where to find more information about her. 
also like to say good night to you. Say good night, Vicky. Good night, everybody. Say good night, Tom. Good night, everybody. Pleasant and good night. dreams. <laughs> <laughs> good night, Laura. And we hope to speak to you soon. Okay, okay. good night, everybody. Good night. Good. Licensed Podcast Production. Till next time, and don't forget to comment or share. We so admirably appreciate your support. Now it's back to Mr. Bandless, Mr. Joshua, and all the goings on at Collinwood. And remember the witch!